this is Paula Martins at the Pheasant Run Resort in St. Charles, Illinois for the 2015 Military History Fest. in an exhibit of an American Civil War POW camp. I'm standing here with Scott and Sean, and they are going to tell me a bit about this exhibit and about your unit. Well, I'm Scott. I'm uh, representing a soldier of the 49th Tennessee that was captured at the Battle of Franklin in Franklin, Tennessee. Um, we fought from all through the Atlanta campaign, through Georgia, through Spring Hill, attacked up the Columbia Pike, and repulsed at Franklin with a large number of our troops being captured. Then we took about two weeks on trains going north with combat troops, and once we got to Chicago, they put us here in Camp Douglas with these Union guys to guard us. We have some men here in some very uh, unfortunate circumstances, and uh, punishment was issued for various crimes. Could you tell us what was done to the different men and what they had done? Um, you'll see uh, the guy right here. He's got a, a ball and chain on, uh, guys that were problem prisoners that tried to escape or uh, were uh, violent. They were put in irons with the ball and chain. So. And uh, th they also, an, a really common punishment at Camp Douglas was the mule. And usually they would make it and sometimes it would be taller. And the idea is that after you sit on that for a while, it starts to hurt to the point where your legs fall asleep and other things start to hurt really bad. Uh, and sometimes they would even, for, if guys were re like had done something really bad, they would tie uh, sandbags to their legs to weigh down their, their legs. How long would these punishments last? Uh, some of the guys, you know, once they got the ball and chain, until they were exchanged, they wore a ball and chain. How about the horse over here? Uh, you could be on there all day. Wow, that is uh, incredibly painful. Yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah. What, what did the men do here, the ones who hadn't been in trouble, what did they do to pass the time? Uh, I mean, you were in a, a camp, there was not a lot, a lot of things to do still, like, you'll see they got a violin over here, uh, they, they actually were encouraged to play music, it broke up monotony, you got less problems, um, you know, anything you could do to pass away the time, but you didn't, you're kind of penned in, and... What was the uh, death toll at this camp? Uh, the estimated death toll, it was 7,000 uh, Confederate soldiers died. Hi, I'm standing here with Dave Fornell of the 353rd Regiment Infantry. And you were telling me about this before. This is a, a sort of a generic uh, exhibit on the World War I trenches. So it tell us more. This uh, event this year, we're trying to do the 100th anniversary of the first use of poison gas in chemical warfare. In 1915, April 1915, they released, uh, the Germans released 5,600 canisters of chlorine gas and uh, opened up a seven kilometer section of the line mm -hmm. and that really started the entire snowball effect of everybody using chemical weapons throughout the rest of the war making the war particularly miserable. Yes, this being the first time this type of weaponry being used and seen mm -hmm. and uh, from what I understand a lot of the uh, civilians and soldiers alike were just almost amazed by it. So the trench system was built uh, with my uh, unit, the 353rd Infantry Regiment that mm -hmm. does German primarily but we also uh, have invited in reenactors from several other units mm -hmm. to do different impressions, British, French, uh, American. And you are French today so. Today I'm, uh, I'm representing the French, which actually took the brunt of the fighting in World War One, yes. and uh, had uh, well over a million casualties in the first year of the war. Mm -hmm. uh, they, uh, the display we're showing not only a collection of gas masks and uh, uh, trying to illustrate the the horrors of chemical warfare in World War One, but also showing some of the living history and personal effects in the weapons from various countries in World War One. We also use this event to promote uh, for our uh, two events that we have coming up uh, here in the Midwest, one in Vincennes, Indiana, and one in Rockford, Illinois, at Midway Village. The gas mask behind me start off with a dog gas mask that uh, was issued to the German uh, dogs for both medical and messenger dogs, casualty gas masks, and we have two versions of the British first pattern gas masks. Uh, several of the guys, including myself, uh, they, we were asking everybody to either carry or actually wear their gas mask in the display. We have smoke piped through uh, to try to add the realism and obviously the sound effects.
I, th I think that's a great addition, the smoke and the sound effects. And it really makes people uh, get a good idea of what was going on in the trenches and how it was like. Uh, only The only thing absent is all the mud. Yeah, we had to simulate mud with uh, some sheeting on the ground, but uh, best yes. you could do inside. <laughs> that is fine. Yeah. So uh, our gentleman here is uh, representative of the 353rd Machine Gun Battalion, and he has uh, trench armor on. It uh, gives full frontal protection against uh, small arms and also fragmentation grenades and artillery. Mm -hmm. uh, it was meant to uh, handle some of the punishing blows that would be sent towards the machine guns. The machine guns were uh, usually a, a, a very favorite target for putting a lot of concentrated fire. So a lot of the machine gun crews, we had armor plates. Some of the stormtroops later in the war also wore these. Uh, he has a brow plate on that's a quarter inch thick uh, steel plate. So if he gets hit in the forehead, uh, it might knock him down to give him a headache, but he'll walk away instead of having a bullet through his head. Uh, he's carrying a pistol as his backup weapon with the machine gun, and he's got a spade in a ready position to pull out, and he'll use that as a close combat weapon. It's sharpened on one side so he can cut into the neck. And then he has a, a later war uh, leather mask, or a leader mask, and the Germans didn't have access to rubber because of the blockades during the war, so they quickly tried to find a substitute standard, and the air set standard that they used was actually oiled uh, leather, which actually worked much better than the rubber masks did. I am here with Wadi from Hammond, Indiana, and he is dressed like he He's back in the 1880s Old West, and I am a born and raised Arizona girl, so what you are wearing is very familiar to me. So why don't you tell our audience about what you have on and why you're doing this impression? Well, basically, uh, it's representative, like you said, of the 1880s, the Old West. Um, cow hand, mm -hmm. post-Civil War, um, and I'm here today to actually meet a few friends to tell them about an up-and-coming show that we're having down in... Uh, Lake County Parks in, uh, in Indiana. Could you tell us about this show? Sure. Uh, well, right now it's in the development stage, but we're trying to bring the Buffalo Bill Wild West show down the lake uh, to Stony Run County Park. And um, we're hoping to get uh, a good amount of people there to uh, bring people to the, to the park there. And what do you do? Do you perform with the show? Or? Actually, yes, I perform with the show, but I'm also a member of a group called SAS, the Single Action Shooter Society. Okay. And uh, we uh, compete in competition shooting and horseback riding, shooting off the horse. And uh, part, of the, uh, sh uh, actually, part of the program is that you have to be dressed in Old West style, mm -hmm. as period as possible. And I am a member of SAS. I've been a member for 20 years. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it, usually you have to be dressed in this kind of outfit. And do you have a tentative date for this event? Actually, we do, but nothing is set in stone yet. It will be June 28th, around that weekend. Hello, ladies. You look beautiful. So please uh, introduce yourself and tell us about your group here. My name is Karen DeZoma. And I'm Mary Beth Townsend. And we represent the Guild of St. George from the Bristol Renaissance Fair. And uh, the, Bristol Renaissance, uh, the Bristol Renaissance Fair, that's every summer from, it's the month of July, or how yes. long does it run for? It runs for nine weekends. It will open this summer on July 11th and run through Labor Day weekend. And, and people who come out to the fair will get to see you all there and ha uh, all your exhibits and things, so... They will, yes. We represent the court of Queen Elizabeth I in the year 1574, when she would go on progress. And in the summer of 1574, she visited the port city of Bristol in England. So we've just translated that. She visits the port city of Bristol in Wisconsin. Well, great. You all look lovely, and you have a very impressive uh, setup. And your, your clothing and, and costuming is impressive. Could you tell us a little about uh, what you're wearing here? I'm wearing something that might be called um, a French cut gown. Mm -hmm. It has a low neckline and it's fit very closely. Mm -hmm. um, these are also a French style of sleeve. It, this puff is actually held up by a roll that's underneath it. Um, my skirt is closed because we're traveling and that's a little more practical, but I could easily wear one that's open in the front with a decorated skirt underneath. Yes, it's very lovely. You both are very beautiful. How about uh, your, your dress here? Could you tell us a bit about what you're wearing? Well, as Karen said, she's traveling. I've already arrived, so I'm dressed and pressed and ready to impress the queen when she arrives and shows up. And I no, no doubt the queen will be very impressed by you ladies. So I am Sir William Cecil, Baron Burley. I am the queen's lord treasurer and her principal advisor. Could you tell us about what you're wearing? I am, like most gentlemen of the court, I am wearing a doublet and slops. Uh, there are other names for these. They can be called trunk hose and various other things, but the everyday term that we might use for them are slops. Uh, this is 
what most of our gentlemen would wear. Some would wear Venetians, but, but I am in, in doublet and slops. Um, I often wear a surcoat in addition to this, but today I've chosen not to. I am Sir Edmund Tilney, Master of the Rebels to Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth. And uh, as far as what I am wearing, if I, if I may, I have the gentleman's doublet with uh, tied in sleeves and the uh, Galagaskins, the uh, uh, Troncos. And this is what I uh, wear every day for my attire. Uh, good day. Uh, I am Morgan Gage, and I am the wife of the captain of the Bristol Trained Band. Uh, we are representing the Bristol Militia. Uh, a trained band is a group of gentlemen from the town who gather uh, for two weeks every six months to protect the town itself rather than having to serve in foreign service. And so the gentlemen are out about right now marching around with their pikes and with their flags and whatnot. Um, what, meanwhile, we are holding camp and keeping things neat and tidy as much as we can. They are very messy gentlemen, but indeed. Um, but we are uh, representing about 1574 when uh, Queen Elizabeth did come and visit Bristol itself. Uh, you have some interesting things here. Uh, well, could you please <laughs> tell us all about this? Uh, yes, indeed. Um, this is my uh, Inkle loom. Um, it is uh, a loom that we use for making um, trim, uh, some belts and things like this. Um, this little bit here, uh, we are, uh, was just creating it so that way some of the guests as they walk by could come and try their hand at weaving itself. Are you ready to play some ball? I am standing here with two Rockford Peaches. Ladies, would you please introduce Introduce yourselves and tell me about your group. Hi, my name is Kathy McCorders. I've been with the Peaches now for a year. Mm -hmm. And you are? And I'm Julie Garza. I've been a Peach for a couple of years. All right. So tell me about this unit and, and what you were doing. As I, we all, some of us are familiar with it being uh, women's baseball during World War II. So. Usually we get together at historical reenactments and we'll reenact a game. If we don't reenact a game, we're around trying to recruit members for the team. Are there other um, baseball teams that, that are represented that you play against? Yes, we have, um, and I, we have four te of the original teams that started in 1943. Mr. Wrigley decided to bring the girls together when all the men went off to war and he wanted to continue the baseball playing and having uh, the people have some enjoyment while the men were gone. And uh, we have a group up in Kenosha and we have a group in Indiana. And what was the fourth one? I always forget the fourth well, one. Well, from my understanding, the women's baseball was very successful at the time. Yes, was it, it in 1943 through 1954? Mm -hmm. And uh, there were quite a few teams by the end of the run. It, you know, a lot of different, uh, even Chicago had a team. Um, at that time. And uh, there was like the understanding that women couldn't play ball and I guess these ladies really came out and said okay just watch us and they did it. Am I correct? They fought hard. Yes they did. They went against their odds and they did. They did. All right well thank you ladies. You look great. All right I'm getting the feeling I'm not in Illinois anymore or well Kansas anymore. I am sitting in a very interesting exhibit and uh, could you please introduce yourself and tell us a bit about your display here. Sure, my name is Ted O'Sullivan. Been doing reenacting, German reenacting for about 14 years. Uh, welcome to the Fuhrer Bunker diorama here at the Midwest uh, History Fest. Uh, we're depicting what the uh, Fuhrer Bunker part of it might look like during the latter months of World War II. And we've got lots of German officers portraying specific uh, individuals and also generic individuals. Very interesting. And a lot of the items you have here are some original or just all recreations? Or Actually, it's about 50 50, but we do have a 120 line uh, field switch board that is actually the only one in the United States. And we've got a second one, but uh, we felt that we weren't going to bring it around this time. But, uh, uh, but we have a reproduction Enigma machine, a torn EB radio, which is actual, and a transceiver, which is reproduction. But uh, a lot of stuff is real and uh, some great uh, reproduction items. I'm Reichsminister Albert Speer, the Minister for uh, Armaments and War Production. Uh, what we're in here is the, uh, the Führer Bunker, 
the, where the high command of the armed forces, along with um, uh, Adolf Hitler, would have uh, conducted the uh, conducted the war. Uh, we have a wide variety of equipment here. You can see it's rather sparsely uh, furnished. That was typical of the bunker. There was not a whole lot of uh, furniture in there. There was some, but not a whole lot. Uh, what we have right here is a 120 line. Um, uh, Feld Kloppenschrank is what it's called. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a field communications uh, switchboard. Mm -hmm. uh, and like I said, capable of handling 120 lines. Uh, you would typically have the operator seated at the chair. This would be on her chest mm -hmm. uh, so that she could speak into it. Mm -hmm. She would have a pair of headphones on and then would have both hands free to be able to operate the machinery. Uh, Moving on over to the uh, to the side here, we have a gramophone uh, from the period. We have a number of, uh, of recordings, uh, just something for some light entertainment. It was very typical. You couldn't always be uh, consumed with the conduct of the war, the things going on. You had to have some downtime, so it represents that. In the center, you have the map table uh, charting the locations of various uh, military units. Uh, also some files uh, that would be utilized in the, uh, in, when issuing orders, when uh, determining what units are going to be sent where, uh, what units are available, what strengths they're at, all that information would be here, would be able to utilize by the commanding generals or other persons uh, involved in the direction of the war effort to be able to uh, make decisions and, and issue orders and directives. Over to your left you have our Funker. Uh, Funker is a signals operator. They would be taking in the uh, radio messages from various units in the field, uh, conveying those messages to the appropriate persons in the headquarters bunker, and uh, making sure that the information was passed along accurately and correctly. To his immediate right is a um, the uh, Enigma machine, which is an encoding machine. It was one of the most complex encoding machines devised. The Allies were able to break the code and uh, and that contributed a, a great deal to the uh, to the victory, eventual victory over uh, the Axis powers in the war. Uh, we have a area to relax over here, where uh, where officers or generals uh, could take refreshment, could relax, take a break. Um, we have the room back here where the uh, where the uh, Fuhrer uh, leads to the Fuhrer's residence, and. Um, that's about it for what we have uh, right here in this particular bunker. Well, thank you for sharing and giving us the grand tour today. So, appreciate it. Mein Führer! Oh, some good news and some bad news. What is it? The good news is I found the paper. Yeah? The bad news is it seems that donuts surrounded us. Idiot donuts! I gave no orders to surrender! Ah! And I'm standing here with Alicia, who looks like just a French pastry. She is beautiful. Uh, Alicia, why don't you tell us about your, your booth that you have here today? Sure. Well, I'm the proprietor of LBCC Historical, and we offer historical cosmetics and apothecary that are made from the actual recipe. So if, if our label says 1747, 1850, that is the exact recipe from history. Yes, they're great cosmetics. I actually use them myself. Um, today I have the clothes on for the eyebrows. Oh, beautiful. So beautiful. I have used that this morning. We also have a lot of gentlemen products as well. So, you know, bay rums and things like that. Mustache wax. Great. My Nubian, which doesn't work. When you look beautiful, so you see next time. I sold you a working slave and you wasted my, him. No, my husband will have a word to say to you. Your husband. Your husband's nothing to us. He's part of the governorship. Do not make him mad. He will make your life a living hell. Hi. <laughs> I'm going to go kidnap Caesar again. <laughs> You're mine. Could you, could you tell us at least how that you're okay. Dora, this is Hollywood. So we okay. Everything on this is wrong. And then we want to explain that or do you want that? Everything on this is crabby. <laughs> the outfit itself that I have on here is definitely a nod to Rome.
Well, you look very beautiful, Lisa. It's, it's still very lovely. Thank you. But to let you know, this is not historically correct. The outfit itself actually came from the wardrobe department of Spartacus, the TV show. Oh, okay. So yeah. See here is one of the background okay. gowns. <laughs> All right. So I got it for a song and dance for another lot of costumes. So I couldn't say no. Plus, it, it gives me an opportunity to play with my friends here. Well, you look very nice. My name is Aula, and this is my place. I'm the proprietress of this fine tavern. Uh, it is attached to the Legion 10, uh, and they're here recruiting locals to uh, join the Roman Legion, and they need to have some place to relax and unwind and get a better meal than the uh, rations that they're normally served. So we provide that. Ha have the men been successful in their recruitment, do you think? I think so. Uh, we've had a good crowd in there and they seem to be jovial. They like to come in and game and of course the more the game, the more they drink and the happier I am. All right. Well, what, what do you all serve here, though? It's, what's some of the specialties? Well, we have a couple of different things that we serve. We like to serve stews and hearty foods like that. Uh, we usually often have a sweet. Uh, we've been featuring our Roman homemade sweets, oh. which is just like a piece of candy. It's made from uh, a, a split open dried date that is stuffed with crushed almonds, drizzled with honey, and sprinkled with black pepper. Oh, sounds delicious. So, thank you. You are welcome. Hello, gentlemen. Could you please uh, tell me your name and what group that you're with? I am John from Chicago, and we're here with Trigata. I'm Anthony from Peoria, and we're from Trigata. All right, now here, uh, as we've looked in the hall here, it's all been historical stuff, and you gentlemen are representing uh, incidents in recent history. So could you tell us what it is that you're showing and, and why you chose this impression as well? That's a great question. I think that modern reenactment, uh, reenactment is a bit of a contentious subject in the community, but we're reenacting a scene from 2002 in Moscow back here. It was the theater siege that you may remember. And on this side, it's the 2004 Beslan school siege. <laughs> representing the school siege and you are representing the theater or what? That's correct. Yes, that's correct. Okay, so um, we'll start with you. Tell us a bit about what the theater in case there's people who don't know and you want to... Sure. As a reminder, in October of 2002, October 23rd to be exact, 40 terrorists took a theater with a performance of Nordost with about uh, 900 people hostage. Mm -hmm. That led to a three-day siege during which Russia began negotiations with the hostage takers and the siege was finally lifted with a special forces assault on the morning of the 26th. My equipment set is from that period. You can see that got an ammunition vest, a bulletproof vest, a heavy titanium helmet, a Gore-Tex suit because it was quite cold out, and a gas mask. One of the details of this, the actual assault was that they pumped in an anesthetic right beforehand, which led to some civilian casualties and caused a, um, a rather um, difficult review of the incident with some negative publicity. Uh, my event was the uh, Beslan School hostage uh, crisis, which took place on September 1st through September 3rd, 2004. Uh, Chechen terrorists, uh, they took over a school in southern Russia. Uh, there were around 1,100 hostages, and they rallied uh, children, teachers, men and women that happened to be in that area into the gym. They wired explosives all over the gym, on the floor and on the ceiling. Uh, the crisis itself took place over three days. Um, by the first day, I believe, uh, Russian special forces had begun to take over apartment complexes that were around the compound of the school. And uh, on the second day of the event, I believe, or was it the third day that the explosion took place? Uh, the second or third day, an explosion took place which was accidental, which led to the uh, special forces assault on the school. And uh, because they were not expecting this to happen, the uh, the raid was a bit botched to begin with, and around 10 Special Forces members had lost their lives as a result, and total casualties were around 380. And uh, like, like I had asked before, why this impression? What is it that you would like the general public to learn about this or know? I'm really passionate about equipment, gear, unit histories, and with a foreign source and a foreign resource like um, this subject material, I believe that going for a recent period, we can get on the ground floor and prepare resources for future reenactors. So we really think we can dig in and get that information and prepare the way for reenactment of the Ru Russian uh, equipment sets in the future. 
Yes, and, and also it shows a, you know, from what we've seen here, a, a, a metamorphosis of how gear has changed and how it's improved and all. So you guys are our latest uh, time period, or our most recent time period, excuse me, and showing what how the gear has changed from as we've had Vietnam and Civil War era, uh, World War II. So thank you, gentlemen. I'm standing here with Tim Wakeling of the 5th Armored Division. He and his group have an exhibit here. So Tim, could you uh, tell us about all your neat stuff here? You got some great weaponry and, and uh, trucks and everything, so please well, tell us. Well, the 5th Armored Division is, uh, is an organization that uh, restores armored vehicles and attempts to uh, recreate history as closely as possible to the way that the actual combat soldiers lived, which is kind of different than what the books say. So with uh, using newsreel footage and you know actual original documentation and original vets, we try to recreate exactly what the true guys that actually drove these vehicles did. And one thing that they all said was that, my God, they had guys that could cook. Mm -hmm. And even after uh, our two month ordeal in the Hurtgen Forest, mm -hmm. which is why uh, if you notice, we're all wearing a little bit of scruffle. The uh, Fifth Armor Division was heavily, heavily engaged for a very long time and a lot of the uh, order was let to stray. Uh, so we have holes in our pants, we have mismatching uniforms, we have lost our combat helmets, and well, we're basically taking a nice R&R &R because the uh, Great Battle of the Hurricane Forest is now over. So we're getting transferred to the middle of Europe where absolutely nothing is supposed to happen for Christmas. And uh, does someone in your camp do all the cooking? Because I think food, yes, food being probably the most important thing to any military unit. Right? And the food was the most important thing to any and every military unit. And General Patton said it best. He said, we have the best food and equipment, mm -hmm. the best spirits, and the mm -hmm. best men in the world. Yes. And he was correct. Yeah. Because even in a two-month engagement in the Hurtgen Forest, and even during the, you know, the attack at Bastogne. The 101st Airborne Division had three hot meals a day. Think about that for a second. Yeah. Surrounded on all sides and cut off for over a week and they still had hot food every day because our military actually prepared our guys for extended duration combat situations and if they needed to, we would drop stuff from the sky for our guys to eat. It might not have been the greatest thing in the world, but the most ingenious mind in each unit that was the most creative with food was assigned the detail of cooking for either that vehicle or for that group of vehicles. And, well, that just so happens to be me. Right. They were not professional chefs and they weren't trained cooks. They were sent to cook school, but it was given as an auxiliary assignment. They were still a combat infantryman, but because they were talented and gifted with food, they were given the opportunity to cook for their men. So they were the early uh, 1940s foodies. And do you know of any uh, of the men in the unit who actually, you know, learned to cook like what you were telling us that came went on to be chefs? Actually, uh, no. And the reason is, is because every one of the the actual combat field chefs that I've talked, I've talked to three, three mm -hmm. original Fifth Armored Division combat field chefs. Mm -hmm. All three of them said they did not go on to be any type of professional chef because food was their hobby. It wasn't something they wanted to do. They were yeah. they all. One went on to be an engineer. Mm -hmm. One went on to be an assembly line worker, and then the other one went on to be a real estate agent. Okay. So. <laughs> between those three you know, like you know completely and totally you know non integrated things they were combat field chefs and they also said that a majority of the time really what they did was here's your food dude all right well thank you tim